Here's where we need to go now. We sort of have a, we have a framework for understanding what's, what we're after. Now let's go on and delve into some of the mm, universal principles about how the body is organized. And what's nice is that if you have a set of a schema, if you have a basic organization, organizing principle, then you can start to apply that and we'll keep doing that to sitting, to, uh, to holding something heavy, to carrying a baby, to carrying, to sitting, to lifting. So but if, but we need to make sure that we have some of that basic theory first. So that's probably where should we, we should start. And then we'll, in the next kind of hour, also hit that where the rubber hits the road and we'll actually watch you guys do some movement and express these things in some mid-range movement. The squat, which is a archetypal foundational movement, and mid-range pressing, getting up off the ground, pressing in front of you, which is also a very archetypal mid-range movement. Make sense? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. As we get into these principles, we wanna talk about first is why we prioritize the spine first. And we do this for a couple of reasons. And this fits with our schema and definition of functional movement too, is that I have to work in a wave of contraction from trunk to periphery, from core to sleeve. And one of the reasons we have to hammer on the spine first is one, central nervous system injury is a bummer. <laughs> and here's the deal, is that if you've ever tweaked your back or injured your back, you know it is not fun. You're down and out for the count, and it's because your body triages it in a way because it's thinking, hey look, this is a primary threat to the organism. You know, you evolved a brain to move through the environment. That's what all the science says. All the research is that, hey, you're wired for movement and you're wired to be able to move through the environment. Uh, skill acquisition is a complex biologic phenomenon to make you move more efficiently so that you can hunt and, and reproduce and do all these things that you're supposed to do. Comma, when you injure the central nervous system, you've put a threat out there that maybe the, the, the animal is gonna be primarily uh, taxed. And so what ends up happening is you have a commensurate response of severity where literally your body freaks out. And if you've injured your back, you know you do not wanna lift heavy things, you do not wanna sit, you do not wanna make out and dirty dance, maybe a little dirty dancing, but you get the idea. But the key is that we wanna prioritize the spine first. And in terms of athleticism or function, you will tweak your back in your lifetime, everyone will, comma, you'll probably heal from that, but it costs you a lot of psychosocial, psychogenic energy to be able to manage that. And if you're an athlete, you know, this means that you've lost two or three days of training, or if it's your neck, we're talking about your hands, and now you can't work, like you're afraid to pick up your kids, the women I've talked to who've had babies and bad posture, it's a disaster. So what we wanna make sure is that we're, we're thinking, hey, we better prioritize the spine first, and that means prioritize the spine first in terms of organize, organization and movement, but also organizing it in terms of understanding what we need to fix first. So we always spick, fix the spine first. The second reason is this, is that the spine has major potential to decrease your force production to decrease your force. And let me give you an example. Can I grab a second, Kyle? Sure. Now when Kyle got up, his feet turned out like a duck and his knees came in a little bit, right? So what we would say is I would give him a coaching cue. It's terrible, dude. All right, so we're gonna make a better decision. And here's the problem. Wasn't thinking about it. I know he knows how to squat. He's a phenomenal athlete, but it's that detail where we start to practice because he became unconscious, feet just happened to turn out. You have to sit in the worst chair possible. It is the worst chair possible, right? And so what was the default? Well, he defaulted right to where he was. So don't do that again. Okay. As my wife would say, make a better decision. Her best coaching cue to me. So here's what I do. Let me show you the, imp the impact that when you lose your spinal integrity, what happens. And this is one of the reasons why Jill's piece coming up is gonna be so important. So spread your fingers out as hard as you can and make those stiff, stiffen them. So what I've done is given him a cue to stiffen his elbow. Eyes level, I'm gonna try to bend his elbow. If he bends his elbow, we have in the back a thousand kittens that will be killed. <laughs> We're playing for, death does not bother you. Kitten killing seems to bother people. Hold, don't let me move you. Now watch, I'm gonna hork on this, don't bend the kittens. <laughs> uh, there's no way, he's legit. Okay, now watch what happens now. All I'm gonna do is have him change his neck position a little bit under load. So when I tell him, he'll look up. We're gonna double the kittens, wheel out the second load of kittens, okay? If you bend, kittens, it's kitten mayhem, okay? Hold, 
Uh, don't look up until I tell you. Be stiff. This is for the kittens. Hold. My daughters are watching this. Hold and look up. And he looks up and he starts to bend his arm right away. And what's happening there is that, put your arm down for a second, is that he has this complex neural mechanical. His nerves and mechanical system of his, of his body all interrelate. In his back, he has this big thing called the thoracal dorsal fascia, which is a big sheet of connective tissue through which all of his spinous processes stick out. And so if he suddenly kinks that position and breaks that, then he loses integrity in that big sheet. And that's one of the mechanisms through which his spine creates its stability. So we've, the, he's lost the sort of the tensegrity or the tension in the sheet to make the whole system mechanically stable. Are you following? Okay, that's one problem. The second problem is that when he puts that back, do you see this tissue hinge right here? He actually is not creating local global flexion in the system, or global extension in the system, excuse me, he's actually creating a hinge, and he's literally hinging at one of his segments. And so he's stiff through this upper back, we know why, because he's a tactical athlete and a big strong guy, et cetera, et cetera, and so he ends up hinging right here. And when he puts a hinge across the nervous system, the body recognizes that as a primary insult and threat to the body because you're basically guillotined or hinged the nervous system. And you kinked the tube, and so it just drops off. And if we extrapolate a, go ahead, that's, that's killing me, go ahead, straight, there you go. If we extrapolate your sitting position with your eyes level, this is what happens if you round it a little bit in your sitting is that your eyes will stay level and orientate, and if we stood you up, you would see the same basic mechanical shape expressed, and this is one of the reasons why all this sitting forward position is so harmful. Now I'm just creating shear and hinge through that segment. I just get a lot of action in that, and I'm like, God, I'm getting this neck pain. It's so weird. And it's not that unusual, but if I extrapolate that and blow it up, it's this position. The same thing happens if he looks down. So we'll do the same thing. Double the kittens or nothing. Okay, this time you'll have to kill the kittens yourself. A little kitten blood. All right, hold on. Kitten blood may be my new favorite band title. Hold, don't let me move you, don't break, be stiff. And then look down, and he breaks right away when he loses that. In fact, when his body undergoes that flexion, his body experienced that as a significant threat. And what's that flexion look like? Sitting in your chair, hanging on the meat, there's that rounded position. So we need to be able to identify some of the reasons is that it puts that nervous system into untenable positions and th threatens my force production, which means I'm threatening my stability. And this is the second reason. Thank you very much. Sorry about all the kittens. So the third reason is this. The spine is the carriage or chassis for the engines, and we call these primary engines of, wait for it, hip and shoulder. Oh, that's a language you understand. Hip and shoulder. Okay. So what's happening is that we call these the primary engines. And what we know is that when I'm disorganized at the trunk, I can't really start to see what's going on in real time at the hip and the shoulder, which means that everything else ends up having a problem. Steve, come here for a second. Oh, good. A little weight on your heels. You didn't have your toe screwed into the ground. That's fine. We'll talk about that, OK? So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to just overextend a little bit. So I'm, just, I'm sitting up at my chair. And I want you to just internally rotate me. So you're going to grab my elbow and push my hand down. Go ahead and internally rotate me until it stops. Oh, that stops. Did you see that? Go ahead and gentle. And when it stops, it stops. Go ahead. And you'll feel it stop. Do you feel it stop? OK. I'm just a little bit overextended. I'm a little bit out of a spinal position. Now watch what happens. As soon as I, go ahead and come off tension real quick. As soon as I put my rib cage down where it belongs, now go ahead and internally rotate me. And see if there's anything changed. Keep going. Keep going. It's weird. Have you hit that hard stop yet? Yeah. No, not yet. There you go. Does that look different? Do you need a laser goniometer to measure that? Or can you see that that impacts my position somehow? Well, all we've done is put the spine into position so that my scapula can relate more effectively. And as long as I end up in a dysfunctional pelvic position, I can't really have optimal hip function and subsequently knee function. If I'm in a dysfunctional rib cage position, or spine position, I'm never going to get hold of what's happening in the rest of the system, which means it's, I'm always going to be disorganized. So we've got to prioritize the spine. Thanks very much. All right? Spine first. Kelly. 
Um, Mark Hoffman in the chat room is saying, uh, is wondering if you would be able to show the sitting and standing bends in the spine on the skeleton. Sure. We can do that quickly. Jill Miller has named the skeleton Nigel. So what's happening uh, is that there's a rod going through this skeleton, and we will not show that uh, flexion extension. What's happening there, though, is that all he's doing is hinging back and forth. And what we really want to make sure that people understand about this is we want to disconnect the technical anatomy from the real function. Because you can identify if your head's in a good position, yes, no. And you can identify basic changes in shape, and especially as we kind of start to get you organized. And that's the most important part. It's useful to have all the physiology and all the anatomy, but that's not how real life works. Already, if you're sitting in a good position and you're managing this versus, hey, have someone take a photo of you from the side. We know your head weighs about 10 or 11 pounds. For every inch in front of your body, it's plus 10 pounds. So now you have a 22-pound head, and now it's a 32-pound head, and now it's a 42-pound head. And now I'm sitting with that 42-pound head out of position, and now I'm going to go run in that position. And you can imagine sort of some of this trauma that we see. I try not to make creepy videos of people moving poorly in the world, but last night I made one in my house, or not my house, in the hotel room, and there was a woman running, and as she was running, she literally was just hinging right up and down underneath one segment. There was just one spot that was hinging back and forth. And uh, if I could have stopped her, excuse me, ma'am, I just want to show you how inefficient you are. I'm not a stalker, but that's not okay, right? So I gave her my business card. I'm a physical therapist. You'll call me. It'll be fine. So here's what the key is, is, is you start to identify these hinges, and we'll give you a, t a temple and a schema for that in just a second. Spine first is our model. Second aspect of this, then, is that when we see movement around the spine, it's pretty a simple idea. We want to avoid what we call local flexion or extension faults, which is exactly what this question is. So if here is the most beautiful woman in the world. You can't see her yet. This is how my wife looks to me, right? What I should see is that I should not see flexion forward or extension backwards, flexion or extension happening in localized positions. So if you see a globally flexed position or a global, globally flexed or globally extended position, like I'm hitting a volleyball at the net, I'm swimming, right, doing a forward somersault, I have to be able to adopt those shapes for sport and life. But if you see me create a local hinge in the system, that's a fault. And you can identify that. And oftentimes, we'll get physically a hinge in the tissue. The places where we tend to see these hinges are at the neck, at the thoracic spine, right at the bottom of the rib cage here. So we tend to see these hinges kind of here at this interface, right here at the bottom of the rib cage at this interface, and at the interface of the, the lumbar to the pelvis. These are sections that tend to kind of get a lot of sloppy motion in there. And so what we want to do is we want to avoid these local extension faults. So the one joint rule is this. The only place where I should see massive amount of flexion or extension is in the shoulder and the hip. Oh, that's easy. And what it really does is it allows me to simplify a lot of the complex movement that I undergo is that how do I break it down to its most fundamental constituents? It's minimal number of moving parts. And so if I'm organized around the spine, the only places where I should see large motions of flexion or extension are in the shoulders and full flexion, full extension, and in the hip, full flexion, full extension. And so when I can start to evaluate some of the robustnesses of people's positions, if all of a sudden you watch me squat, how many hip joints do I have now? Suddenly I have this hip joint, Right, which is undergoing flexion, but I also suddenly have a couple other hinge joints, and I shouldn't. This should be a chassis off of which my basic element should move of just that hip. Does that make sense? Are you tracking me on that, right? No local flexion or extension faults. And what you'll see is that we tend to break a lot in these basic fundamental positions and shapes. And it's easy to identify in movement or in your kids or, or even as you're sitting. So if you're sitting flexed, you've got a local extension fault there. Bam, that's the problem. So it becomes very simple. We start to have a schema now 
for understanding how the body's organized. We need to prioritize the trunk first. Check. Does that, what's that look like? How do I get brakes and organized? We'll talk about that in a second. And then, boy, I shouldn't see local brakes in it. The only place I should see is in the hip and shoulder. Carl Pally, who's gonna be on this afternoon, has a great model for this. He's like, the best example of this is men's gymnastics rings. Have you ever seen that sport? It's a dumb sport. It's ridiculous. Look how stupid this is. Bear with me. Stiffen everything, lock your wrists out, lock your elbows out, and move your shoulders around. That's what it is, right? It's a shoulder movement sport. And like, ooh, I'm so impressed. You weren't, didn't move anything else, and you only moved your shoulders. How difficult is it to do that? I know like five people in the world who can do that sport. That's how difficult it is. And what they've really done is that they've brought down this archetype where they've brought down the minimal number of movements and are expressing rotation through a single joint. That's how difficult that is, to stiffen and simplify these things. And what we want to do is start to simplify the way I pick up my kids, or the way I lift up off the ground, or deadlift. I prioritize the spine first. I should only see movement happen at the hip because that's designed to handle it, right? And then a little bit in the second engine, but it's really about trying to minimize the number of variables in the spine. Sorry about that. So that's the one joint rule, which gets us into the laws of torque. For us, we're fortunate because the shoulder and the hip are the same joint. So they obey the same principles. Physiologically, very, very similar structures. In fact, interesting that they both have a head that looks like this. You'll notice that the, the arm here, top of the arm, is a ball and socket, and the hip is a ball and socket, right? That there are two bones, and that there are two bones, and weirdly, this looks like that foot in a strange way, doesn't it? It's very analogous in its structures. The function is very similar too, and the organization is similar. And once I've accounted for the extra degrees of range of motion, and I've accounted for the scapula, I basically have the same system. So guess what? They organize the same way, which means if you understand how one organizes, you understand how the second one organizes. So take your hand, put it in your shirt. This is the model for how your joint sits inside its joint capsule, which is this bag of fibrocartilage. It's a sack that gives the whole thing integrity. Now, go ahead and grab the shirt and try to tighten it up for me. Tighten up the shirt. You can get all the slack out of it and get it pretty tight, right? But you'll never get it really tight. How would we make that tight? What would we do? Twist it. So if I add rotation to that, all of a sudden, oh my, it's like a piece of candy. It's weird how they wrap the candy up, isn't it? Well, your body has figured out the same thing. And that when I create that rotation inside the joints of the hip and the shoulder, I create stability through the whole system. If you break down the movements, or the coaching cues, then what you're gonna see is most of the coaching cues we've been using our whole life and hurt our whole life are actually cues of rotation. The other ones are about your spine. Get tight, you know, get ready, squeeze your butt. You know, it's all about either prioritizing the trunk first or elbow in, break the bar, knees out. And you're gonna see that a lot of these languages relate to the laws of torque. So in all motions of flexion, which is arm going up, hip going up, there's a corresponding rotational force. What is that corresponding torque or rotational force that makes this, this stable? Now I know some of you guys know this. So here's the deal, is that the problem with my field is that we have divorced the language of movement from the language that you use, which is you've been an athlete and a human being your whole life. We need to leverage that skill set. Everyone can relate to how we're supposed to do things. So check this out, let's, let's break this down for a second. We said earlier, how does the queen wave? Why would she wave in this position? Because the wrist and elbow and shoulder are in an externally rotated position, and it ends up being very stable. And it's weird that the queen waves in the exact same way Head is neutral, oh, because you can do that all day. Head is, shoulder is organized, wrist is organized. And that's the same quick reload for all that we're taught, isn't it? For all of the close quarter combat stuff, for shooting. Oh, it's this, the queen is practicing her ninja skills. <laughs> 007 just brought that out. So the second aspect, what's the finish position overhead with the Olympic lifting? I'm taught armpit forward. And when I do armpit forward, what's really happening to shoulder? This rotation of external rotation, this torque of external rotation. Okay, what about bench pressing? Carla, you look like a big bench presser. 
What do they tell you to do? What did Louis Simmons tell you to do? Break the bar. That's right. So when you break the bar, what's really happening at the shoulder? External rotation. As I screw my feet into the ground, like Mark Bell, the best powerlifter, one of the best powerlifters on the planet, this is his, these are his cues before he lifts 1,200 pounds. He's like, the first thing I do is I squeeze my butt as hard as I can. That sounds like prioritizing the trunk. He's like, then I pretend like my feet are on plates, and I try to screw my hips into the ground through the plates. What's he really doing? He's creating torsion and stability through the trunk. Now, how does the car turn on? That's right, it turns on, but we'll notice that people are so dysfunctional now, so disnormal, that they had to push a button because they can't do that anymore. How does a screw screw in? Or a light bulb? Mm, this is like the, the Da Vinci Code, when you start seeing the goddess in it everywhere, like in the, the Starbucks cup has the goddess too, it's a conspiracy. Well, extra rotation is the same concept. The movie Avatar is my favorite example. They name all the plants, get all the animals right. How did they pull the bow back in Avatar? Internally rotated. So James Cameron, your movie was crap. That was when you lost me. I was like, you don't understand how the shoulder works. This is BS. I'm out of here. And so here's the deal is that all of the cues that we're using, knees out, uh, creating torque, elbow in, how we climb a rope, all of these things relate. I mean, wax on, wax off. I mean, it's all there. And when you start to see this, check this out. I travel a lot at the airports, right? You grab your tongue of your hand with right. I'm right-handed, so I flexion, extra rotation, I put my shoe on, it's all organized and good. And how do I do it with my left side? Well, I'm right-handed, so I grab the same tongue, and then what happens to the hip? You're like, oh, I don't have the hip range. You know what I'm talking about, and you like stumble around, oh, you're crippled, and then you stomp your foot. Well, it's because you don't understand how the body is organized. I know, I know. Mystery of the body explained with Kelly Starrett. Right. <laughs> From butt lamination to putting your shoes on at the airport, it's my dream to explain this to you. Okay. So flexion has a corresponding external rotation torus. External rotation. This is why that when young gymnasts are taught, in gymnastics are taught to block. They hit and rotate, boom. And what we're really doing is we're trying to create a torsion force here. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, extension has a corresponding force as well. And that extension, when the hand is behind, the arm is behind the body, or the hip, in our case, which is really uh, important here in walking, is behind the body. What is the stable position for the hip when, the, when my leg trails behind me? Jody. Internal rotation, of course. What's happening here is that with internal rotation, I become more stable. Now, if in the language of strength conditioning, a jerk is a nice example of this. Because when I jerk, this back foot turns in. What's happening is that the hip is becoming stable, right? So if leg internally rotated, hip internally rotated, we're spinning in when the leg goes behind me is the good stable position for the hip, where everything works, my ankle works better, my ankle, everything works better. What happens then if I'm standing like a duck? and I take a step, am I in a good position or a bad position? Yeah. Automatically, it's a movement fault, no matter what, because now my ankle is collapsed. You can see the torsion in my toe through the shoe. What's happening to my knee? Twisted. What's happening to my hip? Unstable. And then as I swing through, am I likely to end up in a good position or a bad position? Oh. So as we're working on running tomorrow with Brian McKenzie, turns out if you're missing the capacity to extend your hip and internally rotate, what will happen is you'll run your way around that problem, like you're peeing on something, and then you'll swing that through, and uh, you'll end up with a bad position. And this is the mechanism for so many of the running injuries we see. In fact, you'll see people at the park mobilizing or stretching their quads, and where's the leg go? Flies out to the side, doesn't it? Why would it fly out to the side? Well, it's the same pattern. If I'm shorting this leg, what happens? And now I violated that basic principle and rule. If I'm going to dunk a basketball, do I turn my hands back and dunk a basketball? Negative. I'm in this position. I'll, people will always wind up because this is the stable shoulder. And that's why I have to understand this as I do a push-up. If I'm missing this internal rotation concept and my arm comes out, I'm in a bad position. And that's the mechanism for so much of the dysfunction we see pushing up and why people's shoulders get all gristly. Does that make sense? So if I'm holding, if we know that in lotus position, 
What's, what is this lotus position? What's really happening at the shoulder? Bam, they figured it out, right? So if I'm holding my baby and I don't think about creating this torsion, this torque force, am I in a good position or an unstable position? Oh. And this is what we call bridal shoulder, hey, because you're popping the shoulder for your little cute white dress, right? Or you're holding your baby or you're holding your weapon. It's the same, ends up being the same basic shape fault, right? And this is, this is one of the problems. So we need to get under, have this understanding that this basic torque concept really starts to illuminate a lot of the movement principles that we're working with. Yes, Chris. Okay, so this is going back to the spine first, one joint rule. What about people that have a rounded thoracic spine or scoliosis? Um, how do you get them to get into that one joint? Position? Great question. So if someone has a stiff, back, is this a motor control problem? Do I have the technique or can I express the technique? No, what do I have to fix first? The spine. And now we understand how these mobilizations or the tools, the, the, the positional changers, the skills that we're gonna work on tomorrow, how they improve my mechanics so that I can express the right idea. So scoliosis is slightly different than if I have a congenital scoliosis, Right? That's a slightly more complicated conversation where I have a slight bend in the spine. We can talk about that maybe a little bit later if we get there. We still practice and prioritize the movement first, make sure the tissues are working optimally, comma. This is your fault. And we know how to fix that, and we will fix that in the next couple days. So the first thing first is spine first. What do I fix first? I fix the spinal fault problem. If I'm standing like this all the time, what things do I need to get undone first? The things that are maybe holding me into this position, and now I can start talking about function. But until that spine gets organized, and until I start to understand these basic principles, then I'm never gonna be sorted out. This is a problem, isn't it? How did the yogis, can I go for a second, Alex? Can you just go full lotus for us real quick? Just pull one leg up. Go sit, sit down for us. Yeah, easier that way, right? So the yogis figured out that what? When sitting for long periods of time, we needed to put the hip into end ranges of flexion and external rotation, huh? And this torque that she creates in the hip here makes her pelvis stable. We'll talk about that in a second. So one of the reasons that it's important that we understand this relationship is that it's a connected system. So if the hip becomes stable, the back, which is also connected to the hip, becomes stable. So if I'm sitting down, Am I expressing a stable hip position here? No. It's difficult to get stable and organized in this position, right? My, am I sitting in full lotus as I sit at my desk with the hip at its end range? No, I end up sitting in neutral. So I don't have any way to stabilize the pelvis, which we'll talk about in a second. So what do I have to do? I have to default to other mechanics. Otherwise, I'm just balancing back and forth. So my hip flexors get tight and they go from femur to pelvis, they pull me forward, and then there's a deep muscle which Jill will set up for us called the psoas, which attacks to my, attaches to my spine and pulls my spine to my femur, and now how am I holding myself up? Even though it looks like I'm in a neutral position, I have this internal tensioner blocking because I can't do anything at the hip. This is one of the reasons why sitting is so complicated and you cannot sit in a chair in a perfect position unless you could sit lotus in that chair, which maybe you can. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. So, yes, absolutely, pass that over. Um, we always focus on external rotation. What about swimmers? Especially swimmers. What's the stable position for the shoulder when I'm gliding out? Here? No, external rotation, it's the same concept. So the question is, what about swimmers? Absolutely. What we end up seeing, which we'll talk about right now, is that swimmers often aren't missing this corner, right? The fullest expression of flexion and external rotation, this overhead stable shape. What are they missing? The other side. So as the arm comes down, as they finish pushing, they're missing internal rotation, so they compensate. And then what's the next problem? I can't be back in that good shape. So hang on one idea. We'll, we'll flush this out.
I want to introduce you guys to a concept we call the tunnel. This will be the last concept, then we'll get into some movement at home and here. When I start any movement, I know that it ha initiates with a start position and it finishes with, wait for it, a finish position. And our hypothesis is this. If you can express good organization and full capacity to have your body in the best position possible in the start position, and full capacity for the finish position in this arm, this way and this way, then you're not gonna have any problems in the middle because you have enough capacity to start from one end and go to the other end. Are you following me? So do most people have a start walking position problem? No, where is their problem when they walk? The finish position. So what position do people need to work on to improve walking and running, the finish position. Well, this becomes, we call this the tunnel, because we know that once you're under load or once you're underway, it's difficult to reclaim a good position. We know this because we watch the best athletes in the world. When they, we see, see someone squatting and knees come in, you can't get your knees out. So when RG3 jumped and his knees came in, he didn't put his knees out and jump, he had to wait until he was done before his knees to come out. So if he loses position at the start, then the finish is not gonna be good either. Does that make sense? You have to enter this tunnel organized and exit the tunnel organized, especially in movement. So this ends up being what we call MOBE 1. This means this start position piece is can you get into the good start position, yes, no. And if you can't, this is a problem. One of the nice things about our template is that in our gym, in our CrossFit gym, we expose athletes to a full palette of movements, like every good strength and conditioning program should. We're exposing you to all the things that human beings should do. So, Chris, can I grab you for a second? Can you, don't do a pistol, just get into the bottom position of a pistol for me, would you? So this pistol position, his arch isn't collapsed, is it? He, he can get into this. Well, it turns out this is the expression of full ankle range of motion. There is not anything else in the world that sort of requires more ankle range of motion than this complex thing called shooting the duck on roller skates. Do you remember this at the roller rink in the 70s? Am I dating myself? No, not at all. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, so this means he's got full ankle range of motion. For me, if he can't do this, I know we have a problem. Yes, no. Dave, can we see it for a second? Dave's feet were straight, knees were out when he got up. Excellent. Go ahead and just, don't do a pistol, just get into the bottom position of that pistol for us, would you? Without holding on. What, what happens if you don't? Let's see it. Ah. Now we're starting to see the relationship. Is that he doesn't have a start position problem at all. We're starting to see a finish position problem. And what's so nice about our template is that if you're engaged in the basic tenets of strength and conditioning. It's like a formal language of human being, a, a formal movement language of being a human. It's like classical ballet, but expressed as movement that you should do every day. And what we're seeing is, I suddenly don't have to memorize any of these ranges of motion. I need to ask myself, can I get into this position? Now this is pretty extreme, right? But what's not extreme is, can you squat with your feet together for me? Oh, can you just sit down there? Let's pretend like we're in Thailand having dinner. You and I, go ahead. How's it going? This is great. Or I'm in the woods taking a poo. <laughs> These things, this is expression of the full ankle range of motion. Can we see you join us in Thailand? <laughs> ah, my heels come off the ground. So even if you couldn't even relate to doing a squat with your one foot, you should be able to relate to this position. Can I express full range of motion in my ankles? Yes, no. Can I express full range of motion in my knees? Yes, no. In my hips? Yes, no. Right? And in the tissues between, because this is a passive, relaxed, easy position. And so suddenly we've found something that we can work on. And this is the mechanism for why we see so much of the compensation. Remember, overtension can often lead to that open circuit. As he solves that problem in the ankle, oh, his body goes around it because it's about adaptation. 
His body is always going to create a workaround for him so that he can continue to move through the environment no matter what, even if it means it burns his knees or it burns his back in the, in the process. Are you guys following me? This is why this fundamental shape. If you go to Mobility Wad, what was the first thing I ever did on Mobility Wad? 10 minute squat yeah, test. Sure. Can you squat for 10 minutes? Yes, no. Let's have a check. Gang, come on up. Just in that bottom position for me. Let's, let's make, a, we'll make a little circle here. So we have, we can see it, great. Now, this position, when her knee came in, is her ankle, I don't know if you guys can see this yet, come on with us. I'm going to turn around again and squat down again. We haven't talked about squatting yet. Did she move knees forward first? We haven't talked about this, but she did. So that was a movement error. Did that hurt your knees? No, not really. Not at all. You're awesome, right? <laughs> and what we're seeing is in this position is that her ankle is actually not in a good position. It's collapsed. She's collapsed the joint. The stable position for this ankle is knee, oh, all the way out there. And knee out is an expression of what at the hip? External. external rotation. So you're just sitting down here with no external rotation torque in the bottom. And that's that knee in position. So let's see if everyone, so this is our, one of our first movement tests. Can you get into this basic shape? Because this should start to color our capacities. Can you get down yes, no? And what we're finding is, why are your feet turned out like a duck again? Because we thought that that was sketchy, just saying. Duckman Steve. And now we start to see the basics understanding. We can start to ferret out. Remember, our goal is to make the invisible visible. I don't need you to memorize a whole bunch of crazy systems. I need you to understand what's happening in front of you in real time. Are you following? OK, we jumped, the, we jumped ahead a little bit. But if this is our case about understanding how to, to, to move more effectively, then I should make, not make basic assumptions about your mechanics. How many of you guys thought about your spine before you squatted down, did you? Did you forget? One of you? Right, so here's what I'm gonna do. Let me have you guys on your back real quick. We go feet towards the middle. Is this working for you guys over there? Yeah, it's great. Um, we do have uh, a couple of people who are uh, chiming in. Tiffany McCoy says, no way could I do this. My knees would die. Photographic Elements said the same thing. My I can't knees squat would for 10 minutes because so, of knee pain. So she couldn't even get to that bottom position. Good, we're gonna be able to answer that. So our diagnostic tool is what? How we know she's making progress or not. She can perform these archetypal basic full range of motion shapes. Do you have full range of motion in your legs? Yes, no. It's amazing that she can't squat in that bottom position and we, a lot of us have lost that capacity. One of the things we'll see is that people will go whole days and weeks without actually ever performing a squat or full range. They get up from bed, they walk around, they sit on the toilet, Right? They go to the breakfast table, they get in their car, and they go, you know, go to work, and then they come back, still haven't actually performed a squat the whole day. They've just been half range, and that's where we've been living ourselves. So, here's what we're gonna do. Let's start from the beginning. Are we making basic movement errors? And the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're moving in a good position, right? So that starts with the, okay, so let's make sure you're organized. Hands by your side. We're gonna go through this quick. What I want you to do is pick your legs up fast, one inch, go. Hold. Now, what you see universally is that the belly's jumped. Come off tension, turn everything off. We're gonna do it again, ready, go. Do you see what happens that everyone's belly's bulge out a little bit, come off tension, turn everything off, do it again, flinch, and put your head down next time, cheater, and down, okay, and turn everything off, and flinch again, boom, hold. Now, what you're seeing universally in this group, legs down, is that we're violating this basic movement principle, which is spine first, then engines, right? Wave of contraction from trunk to periphery, from core to sleeve. Well, what's really happening is that these guys fire their powerful hip flexors. Go over here so you can see. Go ahead and lift that up again. Boom. He fires his powerful hip flexor. The hip flexor is attached to this low spine on the pelvis, and it pulls on it because it's a simple lever system. And so what ends up happening is that when his spine experiences this moment of shear, this little freak out, so this flinch, his body goes into reactive mode, which is an open circuit fault. His rectus abdominis, his abs bulge, and then there's this other muscle called the psoas, which is, can you see he's making a pain face? 
That's minus one for the pain face. And how do we know that is so tight? Oh, you're about to vomit on TV. That's so awesome. <laughs> so we're clear. This is the filet mignon of the human being. And I know he's probably grass-fed. I'm just saying. You should just know that, okay? Ethan Hawke started in the butt on that movie. I would never start there. So as, okay? You have to eat someone. This is important. Okay. So what we want to understand is what's going on here. And what's going on is that we're having a fundamental movement error. When they fire the leg, the trunk kicks on a second later, and we get the phenomenon of the tail wagging the dog. And so there was no prior movement or conscious spinal stabilization strategy before we moved. And so everything else that happens from this moment onward is sort of a default or is not in a good position in the tunnel. You're going to go sideways into the wall. So you entered the tunnel poorly because you weren't organized correctly. So here's what we need to do. What we're going to do is go ahead and show you a template, but I want to tie some concepts together. So if I bring this leg up, right, this hip crease below the knee, which is kind of roughly squatting, the leg, just relax for me, the leg, don't help, let it be fl dead and floppy, I'll move on. So a couple things. One is that he's missing, this is his total hip range of motion. Do you think that's normal to have five degrees of hip range of motion? I'll give you a hint. He should have like about 130 degrees. So we're seeing that we have one really, really tight hip here. His hip should be able to swing all the way out here. Curious. And you're not even back to zero yet. So there's a ne another joint that you have negative range of motion in. That's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> really is amazing. OK. So here's the deal. Let it be floppy. Let me have the leg. Don't help. Right there is the end of his posterior range. So let me let's see if we can grab someone else here. When I bring this leg up. This hip crease, oh, it's like running into a wall there, Eric. What is that? You knew that? No. Okay. So we're just seeing that this is miraculously about the height of a chair, not full range of motion, but we might see that reflected in his squat when his back. But so if I bring the knee here and, and bring the leg up, relax where we don't help, right where he kicks on is the end of his range of motion. So that's where his hamstrings, comma, posterior chain musculature starts to get tight. And you'll notice he's holding himself up there because he's tricked his brain into thinking, every time this gets tight, I better turn on. So relax for me. You're on TV. There's no pressure. No one's watching. But that's the end of his range of motion. Full range of motion, you guys, is straight up and down. That's full range. So is he missing a big chunk of the pie into that full range of motion? Yes, no. OK. Could that potentially impact? His back, yes. Look how tight the handbrake is right below the primary engine. So we know he's being less efficient. Now, our old model would have said this. Well, it's tight, stretch it. But that's really sort of level one grade school thinking. What we need to do is be a little bit more sophisticated. And we do this by prioritizing the trunk first. So here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to give him a model. Hands by your side. Right? And let's go ahead. Squeeze your butt as hard as you can. And you'll notice that his pelvis changed position. In fact, everyone do that for me, would you? Lay down and squeeze your butt as hard as you can. Did your pelvis change position? Well, what's cool about that is that even if I'm standing, if I squeeze my butt, my pelvis will change position. And that's because my butt has been scientifically engineered for me, not for you. And so if I squeeze it, boom, it will automatically orientate my pelvis into a good position. And what happened was he was laying on the ground and with a poor spinal position. Can, if he's in a bad position, can he stabilize his spine effectively? No. Can he control his hip effectively? No. So the first thing we do when we squeeze the butt is that that powerful glute not only extends the hip, but it also brings the pelvis back to, organize, uh, back to neutral. So the butt sets position, and now the abs can do their job. Now watch this. He squeezes his butt. Take a big breath in your belly for me. Good, and exhale and pull. So he's pushing up, which is what I call fat belly syndrome. So if I was going to try to make a little tiny space around the spine, I'd want to shrink wrap all the musculature around the spine, right? I don't want to try to make a bounce house and then try to stuff that into a duffel bag. Does that make sense? Everyone can try this. Take a huge breath for me in your belly, huge in your belly, bigger, 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 bigger. Now stop. Hold that. Now get tight. How's that going for you? It's like a joke, isn't it? You're like, oh, I'm so full of air. What we need to do is make a little tiny space. So we squeeze the bum, take a big breath in the belly, exhale, and pull your belly button to the spine on the exhale. Draw. Oh, wait a minute. That's a little cue we hear a lot. I don't like the word draw. I don't like the word hollow. I don't like the word suck. 
what I want you to do is stiffen your spine around your belly button or stiffen your musculature around your spine. So we say belly button to spine is a good cue. Take a big breath in your belly. Exhale. Did you lose your butt? Keep your butt tight. Now keep your hand on your belly. Now you're being super tight there, but take another breath in your belly. Oh, what happened? What happened there for him was that he had to choose between either stabilizing or breathing. And he chose breathing, which is what often happens to our athletes and to our people. We can't dissociate the stabilization mechanism from the breathing mechanism, which is what we're going to work on with Jill in just a few minutes. So what's happening here is I need you guys to be able to get into a good position, squeeze the butt, big breath in the belly, exhale, get tight, pull that belly button to your spine on the exhale, keep going, keep exhale, there it is. So the, I see the outline of your rib cage, breath in the belly, exhale, get tight on the exhale, we're stiffening up, we do the same thing every single time. Now they're at like 10 out of 10 stiffness, can you guys get any stiffer for me, get stiffer, get stiffer. That's like a cobra. Bam! Cobra stiff. And what's happening here when they're cobra stiff is that that's before I have peak effort. I'm going to pick something up heavy. I'm going to lift something up, right? I've got to organize my spine. It's peak efficiency. Can I go about my day-to-day -day work with my spine at cobra tension? No, I'll probably black out. <laughs> and my friends will think I'm very strange. So what I need to do is be able to have enough tension to support and stabilize my back and not any more than that. So standing, can you come stand up for me real quick, Eric? Boom. Okay, what did Eric not do before he stood up? Did he get organized? Negative. You disrespecting me, son? <laughs> you have no discipline! Come stand up, Eric. Get tight first. Good. Now, he doesn't mean you have to be like a cobra, but come stand up. Now, the idea here is that in standing, he better be a little bit organized in his trunk. So that means that he needs to have a little tone on. And in our kids' class, because these are very complex concepts. How do we teach this in our kids' class? You whack him in the stomach one time. And now look, he's got his abs engaged. And all I have to do is walk up them now. Because we know that once you hit one guy, they're all afraid of you a little bit, right? That's what you learn on the, on the, I'm a professional person. I never aim low. I practice this a lot. If you do this at home. The key is that I need to him have 20% of his tone on his abs all the time. He cannot walk around abs off. And if you're sitting at home in a chair, what I'm talking about is you cannot sit ever and not have your abs on. If you're awake and up, you need to be able to create this 20% of your abdominal tension all the time. Do you follow? You never get to go on ab vacation. The only time your abs turn off is when you go unconscious. And what do you think happens to your body when you carry a baby or two babies to term? You spend a lot of time in a bad position and can you stabilize in this position? No. In fact, go, Jody, stand up for us real quick. Now go ahead and take your pelvis and turn it over. Good. Now try to get tight. How's that going for it? Now squeeze your bum as hard as you can. Now make your belly tight. Does it get firmer in that position? And that's why this position matters so much. This is my leading indicator. So before I do anything else, I want to optimize position. Eric, on your back again. So squeeze your butt. Big breath in your belly. Exhale, get belly button to spine. Now remember, if he looks fat, it's not good. It's not cute. Pull, you gotta pull. So he, what you're seeing is that he doesn't know, and is he breathing right now? No, he's got a model. I'm either gonna breathe or not breathe. There's no in between. How are you gonna get tight and go up and down the stairs with a heavy load? How are you gonna squat 21 reps? And the key here is that we're seeing an athlete who is having a hard time choosing stabilization or choosing breathing. Now, on last Friday, I went up with the Blue Angels, flew in the back seat, and the, they do this thing called the Hick Maneuver so you don't black out, right? And that idea is that you have to be tight, but you only have about four to six seconds of oxygen there when you're under peak tension before you have to take your next breath, right? Well, so you're like, you have to breathe, and it's hard to breathe while I'm under peak tension, so I have to take another little staccato breath, well, what's happening is that you have chosen, I'm tight, and then if I take another breath, I fall apart. And we need to be able to dissociate those things. So, squeeze your butt, big breath in the belly, exhale. Remember, put your hand there, take another breath in your belly. Ah, uh, and it dropped off, exhale. No, no, don't push, let your belly fall. There we go. Now, you can practice that at home, and here's the deal, your combat stance is your everyday stance, right? Which means, you should be practicing this all the time. You're in a horrible business meeting with your boss, 
you're doing some work, right? You're like, whoa, I'm a ninja, I'm a cobra, you don't even know. You're paying me to be a cobra, that's what I want you to be doing. Are you braced here? Okay, big breath in the belly, exhale, good. Does that change his range of motion? Oh, so it turns out, that looks a little different, doesn't it? In fact, I would call this full range of motion. Right? He doesn't need to stretch anything behind here. And the reason is that I got his spine organized straight. When your head broke, we lost position. When the spine breaks, we see these other, not only does it muck up my ability to generate force, but I said that the spine is the chassis. And if the chassis is disorganized, then the primary engines of the hip and the shoulder don't function correctly. This is why it's so important I know how to brace and how to get organized. So go, push your legs out real quick. We're gonna go five more minutes so we can plan ahead. So here's what I want you guys to do. Squeeze your butt as hard as you can. Oh, and look, some of you guys are pulling your toes toward your face, which is very weird. So here's the test at home. Pull your toes toward your face, squeeze your butt as hard as you can. How's that going for you? Now push your toes away from your face. That's what we call triple extension. That looks like jump roping, doesn't it? This looks like chavasana, weird. This looks like uh, swimming. So point your toes, now squeeze your butt as hard as you can. Oh, it's better, isn't it? And the reason is that when you pull your toes to your face, that's the economy of Greece. And you pull your toes away from your face, that's the economy of Germany. And what ends up happening is that this position, who doesn't like a little economic humor, is that when you push, you're basically making it more efficient to cue that posterior chain. If you can squeeze your butt harder, what can you do with your pelvis? Control your pelvis and spine more efficiently. And this basic concept of getting organized means that I need to do this before I do anything. So if I'm gonna go pick over this microphone, I don't just bend over and pick it up, I'm in a bad position. The first thing I do is get my spine organized, squeeze my butt belly tight, it doesn't have to be cobra tight, and then I can reach down and pick up the microphone. Do you follow? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Real quick, lift your legs up, fast. Did you get braced beforehand? And you'll notice that you're not breathing, Kyle. See how you're holding your breath? So come off tension. Let's get organized this time. Point your toes, squeeze your butt, big breath in your belly, exhale. Now lift up. Is that better? Don't, don't hiss out, that's weird. Good, now are you in a better position? Now, can you stabilize in that position and talk? A, li a little bit. Right? You're picking your head up, Henry, because I know you're trying to cheat me. So I'm not looking now at, is your abs bulging? Because of course your abs are on, they're your abs. Come on, off tension. But what I am looking at is, did you have a horrible spinal flinch? Remember what happened in the beginning? Turn everything off, lift your legs up fast. Oop, there's the flinch, did you feel it? What do we have? A local extension fault, bam. Do this test for me, lift your legs up fast. Now flatten your backs out. Flatten your backs out. Now I'm a good coach, I'll say it twice. Flat back, flat back. Flatten your backs out. I didn't say lift your head up, cheater. Flat back out. Can you do that? Can you reclaim a good position from a bad position? No. And so here's the deal. Once you've entered that tunnel, we need to reset because you can't reclaim that position, right? Flinch again one more time for me, flinch. Now take a big breath. Where was your breath? It was in your chest. Is that where your diaphragm is? So take a look at this. Do that again for us, Ox. She lifts up, flinch, right? She's lost her spinal position, take a big breath. It's in her neck and in her, and her chest. So what happens is, come off tension here, is that when we see an athlete who has lost position or a person who's lost position in the spine, what's happening is that I've made it impossible for them to have good breathing mechanics. And so everything is sort of dysfunctional. So what happens if I breathe in my neck all the time? Jill's gonna talk about this. I tend to get tight, I tend to get stiff. And what happens here is that this is a big diaphragm called the diaphragm. And you have another diaphragm in your pelvic bowl called your pelvic floor. And guess what? If this pelvic bowl, this diaphragm doesn't work when you're out of position, neither does this one. And it turns out that the best research around about pelvic floor dysfunction means that the first thing we have to do with any of our athletes with pelvic floor dysfunction is correct their pelvis. Then we can get them bracing and then we can get them moving. Does that, are you guys following me? So come stand up real quick. Pop on up. Are you organized? Did you get organized? Were you, were you braced there? Okay, so now put your arms over your head, full range. Elbow straight. I need the elbow straight for the win. And the question is, are you in a good spinal position? Yes, no. Is he in a good spinal position, gang? 
No, he looks like a broken banana. And here's the key, is that, come on in the middle, is that we see athletes all the time sacrifice this basic spinal position to get something done. You will burn your, your back down for your shoulders. So, any change in spinal position is a fault. Is that correct? So it's not okay to change my back when I, round my back when I deadlift, or if I pick something up off the ground, I have a flat back. So he squeezes his butt, he gets his belly tight. Good, now this is organized. Now put your arms straight up over your head for me. Uh, no, don't break, keep that rib cage down. This is our stable position. And now we can start to see, don't you think full range of motion looks awfully like the leg on this other side? And what you're seeing is that we're missing a ton of range of motion in this position. Turn from the side, range of motion, and he's starting to decay. Can you see the local extension fault here? Rib cage down. Keep that rib cage. Ah, there we go. Now his arms are out in the crazy YMCA. Full range of motion is, oh, straighten your elbows. There's that full range. So what's happened is that, once again, we are missing this big chunk of range of motion here. And why? Because all I did was prioritize the spine first. And you feel like you can't go any further, right? Oh, what, no. Go ahead. What happens if you go further? Go further. Go further. Go further. You're going to hang. Oh, and now we've sacrificed the spine. So this fine first, first paradigm makes a difference. If I'm swinging a kettlebell, everyone, arms up overhead as far as you can. Squeeze your bum as hard as you can, right? The gymnasts have a simple rule. If you're in the air, you better have your butt squeezed and toes pointed. So butt squeezed. You don't have to come up on your toes. But now straighten your arms out for me, Jody. Belly tight. Now on the three, we're going to turn our butts off. Ready? One, two, three. Did you all overextend? Oh no. So what happens when that heavy kettlebell comes flying down? Am I in a good position or a bad position? Uh, and that's the problem is that most of us are very comfortable with a lot of movement in our low spines and low backs. So here's what we need to do. We're going to see if we can attack this spinal stabilization model. Can I get stable before I move? I prioritize the spinal position. And how do I do that? Is that, is that rocket science? No. The second model then is I take a breath in my belly, exhale and get tight. Now, I only need 20% on in standing. You don't have to be flexing your cobra hood all the time, right? Running around the building might be a 60% solution, but this is I need to have 20%. So for the rest of the day, if I get all sketchy near, you know what's about to happen. Okay, the wushu ab slap. All right, so here's the deal. We need to be here. Now, I need to be able to also take a full breath in my belly and have my belly button move in and out or be able to fully expand that. The tighter I am, the harder that is. The looser I am, the easier that is. And no wonder when we're breathing hard, what happens to our spines? <sighs> I tend to be overextended and broken. So here's the piece. If you can't stabilize with this basic construct, and if your diaphragm isn't working effectively, because we know you're out of position, we're going to see problems. And this is a perfect segue to bring on Jill Miller. Because Jill is going to take us through what we think is one of the biggest problems we're seeing in the athletic community, is that athletes know how to get tight temporarily, but we're not seeing efficient diaphragm function, and efficient breathing function. And this is mucking up my ability to be in a good position. So part of this test that we're going to do, retest later, is just getting into the stable position. Squeeze your butt, belly tight, exhale. Can I find this position? This is my hollow or not my braced kind of working abdominals. And look, everyone looks all jacked and uh, husky. Nice, looking husky. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to kick it back to you guys while we uh, move some chairs around, OK? Great. Fantastic. Right. Um, we'd love to read you a couple quotes uh, from people over. online, Kelly, while we're moving stuff. Um, uh, Adrian Farr, uh, we have a big photography audience, obviously. Um, and Adrian Farr says, this course really is for everyone. As photographers, we will often spend hours shooting with bad postures and in uncomfortable positions in order to get those shots. Yet we rarely think about why we might have neck ache or back ache when we wake up one day. Well, check this out, right? And I, the idea is, you know, all I, if, the, if this is just the chassis for the, for the camera, maybe I should just think about how the chassis is working. I agree. Perfect. And we have uh, Ash New Media on Twitter who earlier said, I don't feel guilty anymore about sitting cross-legged in Lotus at work. <laughs> so, Truth. <I> said, <laughs> and then Hawaiian M5 uh, point out, holding my baby or your weapon. This guy's great. <laughs> <laughs> and people are also sort of having revelations. Jay Tunity says, 
I'm realizing how 80%, if not more, of Americans are living wrong, and I would extend that out, perhaps, outside of America as well. To the world, for sure. I'm sure there are some farmers somewhere who are doing subsistent torque farming, yeah. and they're living off the land, and they're buying, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting a lot of reaction on, um, online. And I would encourage people, as we're going into this kind of more movement-based area, clear some space in your living room. Um, put the computer or whatever you're watching on, on a desk and, and join along. Um, it's going to be a lot more effective if you're actually participating. Because um, I know that I was seeing people, and I'm not going to call you out by names, who were saying that they were slouching on their couch right. while they're watching this. <laughs> Naughty. I've been catching my, my posture as we go. So you do the same. Right. Are we good? We've got uh, a quick question in the audience, and then we're going to introduce Jill. Yeah, so Kelly, I understand what you're saying about being organized and maintaining that through the day or practicing at a meeting. Is that so that when we have to reflex, like earlier, and we get all out of whack, that it's actually ready to go in a sport, you know, under quick motion, you know, say you're getting ready for a squat or deadlift, makes more sense. Um, but then when we're doing Perfect. it in you know, live time, it seems like we're kind of out of whack and so uh, messing up. The real issue here, and, and this is, I'll just spend one minute on this concept, is that if I make my combat stance my everyday stance, then what I'm really doing is undergoing a very complex biological skill acquisition system process called myelination. And that as I m myelinate this motor pattern, where I practice a certain motor solution over and over again, that becomes my default motor solution. That means that I don't ever have to think about getting organized because I've practiced it so much it becomes my default. And that's what we want for people, is that when you're fighting or playing soccer or lifting your kid out of the car, initially you have to be very conscious, but after a while, that should be a reflex that you're already organized because Every single time you've, you've practiced this enough that it becomes your default tendency. And what I'm saying is, in the gym, we see a lot of people who are very uh, diligent, but they can't connect their gym time to their actual physical practice. And subsequently, it's out in the world. They're like, all I did was reach for the pillow and it blew my back out. And I was like, that was one hell of a heavy pillow. <laughs> and uh, what's really happened is that people aren't making the connection. So when we start being a little bit more meticulous in our skill practice throughout the day, and this is why I think the gym is such a wonderful place to practice these skills, the yoga, the, the Pilates, all of these models of, of practicing the getting braced that becomes the skill set. And what we need to do as coaches and teachers is connect the dots a little bit more effectively. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Absolutely. Initially, you may need to squeeze your butt and get tight before you swing the bat, but after a while, you're worried about where everything is and the people cheering your name, and you're going to be like, I'm already organized. That's it. 